Hello everyone and welcome back to Critique Clinic. If you're new around here, this is our video series where we critique and give feedback to miniatures submitted by the Siege Studios Discord community. Yeah, we had some really awesome entries this uh, fortnight. So yeah, some really, really cool models, nice and bright, which is great. Uh, so I'm a big fan of bright colors. So there's quite a few awesome ones to go through. Okay, so our first submission we have here is what looks like a Bad Moon's Death Dread from Della's DNF. Well, it, you can tell straight away it's Bad Moon's just with how vibrant the yellow is. And I've got to say, that's a really great job that you've done with making it so vibrant. Um, having a brighter color to start off with is really important, especially when you are thinking later down the line to add weathering in the story you're going to tell on that miniature. Um, it just gives you a much better scope to be able to create that subtle tonal variance with weathering, effects, chipping, damage, rust, all those kind of things on a brighter surface. If you start darker, it can be a little bit harder sometimes. Um, and I think that you've done a great job in just getting that vibrant yellow everywhere. Um, yeah, so I think first thing to note is that the model is very, very clearly and neatly blocked out with all the different armor sections. You can see here that you've got all the metallic sort of working metals. Uh, and if we go through some of the other photos here, you'll see that around the back, there's some uh, like orange vibrant sort of glow effects that they've gone for. Yeah, I think that works really well. I, th I think one of my favorite things, just looking at it straight away, is that, it, like like you said, George, it's, it's sectioned really, really well and neatly sort of like painted in the sense of all the blocking out of the sections of color. I'm going to say it because I always, always something that I pick up straight away, like the use of like primary color triad. So primary colors obviously being yellow, red, and blue. You've done a great job of actually using the blue and the red to just pick out certain details on the miniature, like the alt glyph uh, with a spanner on the right arm. And then you've got like the little glow lenses on the front in the blue. I think the use of those spot colors using the primary color triad works really, really well. I'd probably say you can, you can afford to maybe put a little bit more red or a little bit more blue on it just to sort of balance it a bit more because the percentage split between those three colors currently is really, really heavily in favor of the yellow. Well, that being said, I do actually quite like how it's this sort of a visual interest. It's because there's less of the blue, I do think that that draws your eye more to it. Yeah, that's, on that eye. that's very, very true. I was saying there's like right around the back, there's a couple of little things that you could potentially make like a button or a light or something like that, like the working function. Yeah, that's fair. You, you can, definitely can't see any sort of blue elements coming in from the back. Yeah, the, the barrel definitely on the back. So doing that that barrel in red as well just works well. If you watch the previous week's critique clinic as well, we speak about barrel on orc, orc commando. So like the same kind of like like things you could do to it, you could do on that. So for example, like the weathering or just on the ribs, catch that add weathering on those ribs of the barrel just to show they're the parts that actually um, have function and stuff. Um, but yeah, the metals look great. The nice subtle. I like the fact you've been quite subtle with the weathering as well. As I, with the rusting on the on the sort of like weapons and claws, they'd obviously be used quite a lot. Um, and then obviously because they're moving and functioning parts, they probably wouldn't be sat collecting sort of like well, I say collecting rust. They wouldn't be sat sort of building rust on them if for, if they're moving around as freely as they as they would be. Um, I would possibly say that you can go a, not crazy, but you can be a bit reserved with adding some blood effects onto the onto the onto the blades. That's a really good way of adding a more red and balancing the the triadic split of colours on model by adding red onto the blades or adding blood, obviously, which is red onto the blades, um, and that that would just give you a bit more interest on on those. Um, you can also counterbalance that by doing some really really like vibrant silver chipping on them as well. So I'd get a sponge, potentially just do some super bright silver chips on there. I can see you've done some edging and things on there, which looks great. Um, but if you get the brightest silver you physically can and sponge it on just really subtly and gently, um, that'll just add a, another level of refinement of like of the the scratching on the metallic areas, and it will counterbalance the the rust on there quite nicely. Yeah, I do agree with that actually, because I think one thing to note is even though you've got all these sort of machine working parts as you said sort of building and collecting up the rust one thing that i would probably not expect to see that on would potentially be the blade yeah like the saw blades here because they're working they're cutting through things constantly any uh, build weathering up. build up of rust or corrosion would would be because it's spinning constantly and it's cutting through things you're not going to have that build up as much on there no exactly and i think yeah. because the metallics are quite dull sort of overall and weathered it would add that extra step of contrast and it would draw the eye more to that blade if there was for example like you said some some blood effects that would bring the nice uh the color theory in there with the red but i think if you didn't want to go that route or even if you did just on some of those sharp uh saw blades like especially around here i think that just bringing out some brighter silver potentially some edge highlighting if you didn't want to go the sponging yeah, yeah. route as well i think that would be a uh, that would be a very, very small time investment for a very, very big overall impact, I think. No, definitely. And just, just so in the order of things, I would do the I would do the the brighter silver first and then do the blood effects. Yep. Yeah, that's the order of doing it. The other thing, the two things that are for me that are just jumping out that I wanted to comment on are like, I love the fact you've used white on the skull, on the on the um, the jaw as well. I think that looks great. I can see a little bit of weathering on the jaw, like a nice subtlety of weathering that's on there. I think same again, you can go in with like, um, with, when it comes to painting white, I'd always recommend don't go to 
to the, the the brightest point with the white when you apply it first. I would have, I'd personally go a little bit more desaturated. There's a really good color from Vallejo called uh, Vallejo White Gray that you can get, which is like a desaturated white. It's not super desaturated, but it's just not the brightest white you can get. And then what I would then do is sponge some brighter white on there and then sponge some like rhinoxide or like a darker brown or something on there just to add again, it's a little bit of weathering onto that white area on the, uh, on the, on the sort of face plane. I do think potentially that this white actually isn't as bright as it may seem just from this photo. I it think could it be might a photo, be yeah. A little bit of overexposure here. If we look at some of these other images, I think it does look. A oh little yeah, bit actually, darker. yeah. Tell yeah. like in that photo, it does look a bit more desaturated. I, well, in that case, then I get some sort of really vibrant, bright white, and then I'd sponge on just on the edges and some areas of detail. I'd sponge on a little bit with a, a brighter white, and then going with the rhinoxide, and then just literally just sponge that as well. I think that would work quite nicely. I think it's nice when chipping is done. Sort of, you always expect uh, chipping and weathering to be darker than the surface color, but I think it does actually look really nice when you go brighter. We well, you're, well, you're, well, you're creating the highlight on the paint exactly, basically yeah. so that that's what it basically is it's the light catching that edge of the paint um before you put the the the, the weathering on it and and talk, talking about it there's really briefly like there's two ways of doing weathering you can either apply the, the brown chip first and then edge highlight it uh, all the way around or then you can just do the the white first which is the highlight and it gives you an area to work within it's a bit more controlled and you can it, it's less opportunity for you to make mistakes when you do it that way so i'd recommend that and then the final note is just it's just the basing. I think what you've done is really great. I said like those orange tones on the base as well. It kind of in, integrates the model onto it. Personally, for me, I'd probably do a, a bit of a different color base just to contrast the model a bit more potentially. It's got, a, you've got a lot of orange on the back of the model where you've got that glow effect and stuff. And I think you've got a yellowy, orangey kind of base. Again, this is just opinionated. And we all, I always say this on, on you know, on the, on the critique clinic is that, we, we give feedback in two forms, which is opinionated and factual. Like if there's something factually like a mold line or something's not drilled or something, we'll say it. But I'll caveat this with uh, being an opinionated statement. I would personally, for me, if it was my model, do a, just a di totally different toned base so that there's not the same orangey tones on the base as there is on the model, if that makes sense. But that's just that's just a completely opinionated statement. Yeah, and just following on from that as well, I'd say uh, just spending a couple of extra minutes just to tidy up that base room as well, I think we'd add a, an extra layer of making this model look really nice and finished. What colour though, George? <laughs> well, I won't detract points for it being black, but I will detract <laughs> points for the, uh, for the scuffing around the edges, I'm afraid. <laughs> Okay, next up we have a submission from Bohemian Knights with a Raven Guard Lieutenant. Okay, first off, I think we'll have to address the uh, the, the goose in the room. Yeah, definitely. I'm going to say this. I've never seen a, an Astartes with an accompanying pet goose, but um, I, I, you see it all now, so that's <laughs> great. I mean, I, it's hilarious that he's just not even attacking the enemy himself. He's sending his... Uh, his best little friend to do the job for him, which is just great. Um, again, really, really cool model. Uh, we're not going to knock points off a of Raven Guard if you watch, <laughs> if you watch the, the podcast. But I think they definitely won some points back with the tactical goose. I definitely think so. Yeah, yeah, yeah definitely think so. Um, so Bohemian Knights here has asked for some feedback specifically. They want to paint in the heavy metal style, but they're looking on some ways to make the black uh, armor pop a bit more, as they put it. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I black is a difficult one, and I, I like you've got different avenues that you can go down when it comes to painting black armor. Um, and that's uh, and, and one thing I would say is that like there is no right or wrong ways to highlight it. Like you can go gray if you want, you can go blues if you want, you can use almost like really dark greens if you want as well. There's there's various different ways to do it. I always kind of relate it to if you look at like a crow or a raven, the way that in the light when the light hits their their plumage and feathers, that it kind of has like an iridescent kind of like purpley blue greeny kind of hue. I like to paint my black in that vein and I would always pick personally blue. So I go down the route of using colors like Inky Be Darkness, uh, Thunderhawk Blue, Fenrisian, and then Blue Horror. That's kind of like the way that I would I would do it. I think because you're using white on the model, um, it, it kind of makes sense to use potentially greys. I think having that kind of like similar sort of neutral tone kind of works quite nicely. I think it's a bit more like Raven Guard uh, known kind of color style yeah, as well I, to do that I, more grayish so, yeah. black. Yeah, I mean, I, I think one thing definitely is to just, I would always recommend like when you're doing, if you're doing it in the heavy metal style, start with your chunky highlight as a very desaturated kind of like uh, gray. So it's kind of like, it, it it's visible on the model, but it's only like a half stage in vibrancy, if that makes sense. It's not like what you'd normally do as a first highlight. Um, just well, just to elaborate on that a little bit, because I'm not entirely sure that we're seeing that with this. So when we speak about the heavy metal chunky style highlight, what we're talking about is if you look at the box art miniatures, what they would do when they're edge highlighting, it's not a one color edge highlight painted around the edge of the model. That's often a place where people start with edge highlighting, but when you want to start taking things to the next level, what the heavy metal painters for the box art miniatures do is what we refer to as the chunky highlight. So that's a first stage edge highlight, which isn't actually very, very bright at all. It's just a little bit brighter than the actual armor color itself. And it's painted 
a little bit thicker than you're actually capable of painting an edge highlight. And then you paint what we call the thin highlight within that. Mm -hmm. So you've basically, if, if you imagine a line and you divide it in half, so you've got that first chunky stage and then you've got the second thin stage on the edge there. I think if you're potentially not ready in the brush control to do that first stage, what I like to do is to just find some brighter corners and pick those out in a in a slightly brighter color than you've done the first edge highlight with. And what I mean, what I mean by that is on areas like, for example, the corner panels here on the on the sort of toe caps, on the upper areas of the knee, and especially the shoulder plate. If you go just to the edge of that point, so not going along the whole edge, but just towards the corner, just picking it out of a slightly brighter color, I think adds a ton of contrast. Yeah, definitely. And, and then uh, on top of that as well, again, it's totally dependent on your brush control. But once you've done that, I, I massively advocate doing dot highlights on the corners as in the highest points. And I typically would do it um, at the highest point on each armor section. So if you look at the knee, for example, you've got the gorget, which is the bit of armor that sticks up from the knee, which stops like debris from uh, uh, like sort of like hitting upwards if there's an explosion on the floor or something like that. Um, I would normally highlight that in the center. So I, you've got the curve and I'd highlight it just in the central point on there and do the dot as the brightest point in the center, which kind of works. And you can follow that, that theory across most of the areas of the model. Like if you look at the audio receptors on the side of the helmet, you've got the armored top part and you've got the metal disc, which is the audio receptor. That, uh, that edge highlight that's on the top of it, I'd put the dot just on the actual apex or the highest point in the center of that as well. So again, that'll just draw the eye to those highest points and really sell that light is hitting those areas at its zenith or the brightest point or the highest point, if that makes sense. Yeah, what I would actually advise you do is if you go and have a look at some of the Raven Guard miniatures from the Evan Workle team on the box art, or if you go on the Siege Studios Instagram and have a look at some uh, black armor that we've painted before, if you zoom in and you look at those photos and you, you, know, you do actually study those images, just take a moment to realize what is actually lighting from the camera and what is actually painted on the model. Mm -hmm. If you look at the corners of those models, you notice that it tends to be brighter. 99 times out of 100, that is painted on color. That is not a trick of the camera. Yeah. Uh, I, so I hope that answers the questions about the black, but obviously if you've got any other thing, anything else you want to ask, then feel free to chuck it in the comments or, or talk to us on, on Discord. More than happy to, to help you further. Um, other things to talk about this, because I think you've been really, really great with color selection on this. So that, and I'm going to talk about that now. Like I think we've often spoke that sometimes when they're just black and they have no accent colors and things like that, they, they can look a little bit bland, like darker models, like blacker models. That's why things like Legion and the Damned have got like flames on them. That's why sort of like Iron Hands have got the white gun cases. It's just it, that other color helps to just break up the sort of drab kind of feel that black armor tends to have. Um, the red that you've done on here is really great. I love the use of the the transfer, like the checkerboard on the thigh, thigh plate armor. I think that was great. Again, you've got really vibrant wax on the purity seals, the lieutenant stripe as well. That use of red's really great. And then you've used blue as well, which looks really good on the plasma um, uh, to just add, sort of add another sort of like color on there. And also you've got a balance of like warmer and colder color temperatures as well, which I think looks really, really great. Um, for me, I mean, I've got to say it, the, the, the contrast between the goose and the marine is brilliant. Like, and I, I like what you've done with the goose as well, where you buy it, the, the, the shade and you've done in between the plumage looks really great. Uh, the yellow bill is just a really nice use of that yellow as well. So even, even on this miniature, you've got a nice primary color triadic split between the accents, which I think is really good. Um, the basing, I mean, for me, uh, just, just jumping around the model, the basing you've done is really great. Again, really nice, warm, sort of like high contrast green tufts, obviously on a brown uh, kind of like more sort of drab base, which again, just a nice balanced base. I think this is one thing that sometimes a lot of models suffer from, which is like uh, all the attention being on the miniature and then not being lots of attention on the base. I mean, this one's got a goose on it for a start. So that's, that's, <laughs> that's, a, that's, a, that's a, a really good kind of like eye-catching piece. Um, but the use of the colors on the base, the interest that you've added on there. I think there's a lot working really well for the model on there. Yeah, I completely agree. You've definitely done that. That introduction of colors added so much to make the, the color scheme, which is normally a bit bland. Let's be honest. It's, it's added tons of visual interest. I think you've also like spaced it out on the model nicely as well. So you've got something on the knee mm. as well as on the opposing shoulder. So it's, it's constantly making your eyes sort of draw across the whole model rather than having this one like flash of color say if you've just done the shoulder pole with the trim mm -hmm. that's a nice addition of color but it's kind of nowhere else on the model but because you've got it all the way from from one corner to another and as well on the black and like you said with the, the pop of blue with the plasma um one final thing that i just wanted to commend you on as well was the the freehanded text that you've done on the shoulder plate yeah which has a really nice brush control it's very very legible text i think that adds a, a ton of extra interest and value to a more special miniature with a lieutenant. Yeah, no, it's great. I, I like I said, like George said, all the edging looks, looks great. I think that one thing to definitely say to you is like practice your, your, your brush control with a point of the brush. And you can do that by painting straight lines as much as, much as possible. I know it sounds a bit boring, but just, 
just paint straight lines. But genuinely, the more time and effort you put as like a warm up session for your painting, the first five, 10 minutes, just drawing some straight lines with a brush with consistent paint, that kind of gets your, your, your muscle memory in your hand to a position whereby when you approach the model, you're not just doing your first brush stroke on the miniature. I think that's something that we're all a little bit guilty of. We get a new model or we're working on a model and we don't think about warming up before we apply the brush to the miniature, which which will actually translate if you just spend a couple of minutes just getting used to the use of the brush before you apply anything onto the miniature. Okay, our final submission this week is from Aiden, and it's uh, it's good to see some Age of Sigmar getting a look in on the show. Definitely, yeah, we've gone on a journey from forty k to Age of Sigmar with a goose in the middle. So, uh, <laughs> so, 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 yeah. Um, what an impressive model to start off with. And, and like, you've done a phenomenal job on the painting, just looking at it, like the vibrancy of colors and things, but to tackle a miniature with this much detail on it and this much going on is, is, is a real testament. Like it's not, it's not an easy project to look at it once it's either built in, built in, in single, in single piece, or if it's in sub assemblies and look at it and go, where do I start with this thing? But this is the sort of model where you're building it and you're putting it together and you're, you're, there's no real obvious place to start, is there? Because no. I'm, I'm assuming that some of this has to be sub-assembled out anyway. Yeah, You've got yeah. such a variety of textures from the from the leaves on the base, which I know are actually sculpted in part of the kit. Then you've obviously got the stonework. You've got the the sort of throne itself. Then you've got tons of textures as well from the lizard skin. You've got the snakes on there. Then you've got lots of metallics with the the sort of headdress. And then again, more stonework in a variety of colors. So there's a lot going on. Um, it's really nicely blocked out though, I will say. It's it's quite obvious what all the sort of textures are, even for quite a busy model. Yeah, definitely. I, I think for me, like I think the use of that blue orange kind of split between croak and that kind of um, stone part of the top is really good. Those those contrasting colors work really well. One thing I do really like is the levitating stonework that's around Lord Croak. I like the fact you've copied the box art um, and I think that the, the use of the color transition on that just works extremely well to kind of sell that it's either got like energy or that it's moving or something like that. I think that, I think with a model that's, this static especially when you've got the components that look like they're flying around or whatever it's a really clever use of color that you you emulated on the box art by marrying that and i think that works really well well speaking of the box art i guess this is a bit more of an opinionated statement but i, I think on the box art the lord croak's skin itself is quite dark that like dark frog green but personally for me i think that the fact of the center points for a miniature generally speaking is the face i think that Having the face be much darker than the surrounding, I think for me personally makes, because the model is quite busy, I think there's kind of no obvious point where your eye is kind of trying to fixate and, and center on. I think personally for me, actually, I would have gone maybe a little bit darker with that stonework around the outside and perhaps a little bit brighter with the skin, particularly around the face. I know a lot of it is obscured with that headdress and that is, you know, your eyes drawn to that headdress, fair enough. But I know you can see some of the sort of surrounding eyes and cheeks as well. I think having that a little bit brighter than the stonework around the outside, I think might have drawn the eye onto the center point a little bit more. Yeah, definitely. I mean, uh, one thing that I wanted to kind of like marry onto that is that I think if you'd have gone a little bit darker with that, the the stone that's like levitating around him potentially, what that would have given you the opportunity to do is that the jade that's on the model, jade obviously comes in a whole host of different colors and tones but i think when you've got a model this busy that's got this much kind of like greens green tones going on and like hues of different colors on there i think one thing that i really would probably have done personally myself would be i would have made the jade a little bit more green in hue rather than turquoise because then that way it would it would read more as as that jade stone and i think when i when i was looking at it in the photos other things that you can do you can add kind of like little cracks and little details and things onto there to just show that it's quite aged uh, as well. Like uh, this, this, all these bits of stone are moving around him, obviously, and levitating and stuff. I think that when when I was looking at it, the color of like the sun part in that kind of like orangey kind of like goldy kind of tone works really nicely. But I think that you, if you'd have punched that a little bit more emerald in hue, it would just sell the jade a bit more potentially. Um, that's just an opinionated statement. There's nothing factually wrong with the colors you've used. It looks great. It's nice and vibrant. But I think that if I were doing it, I'd probably make the, the jade a bit more green personally. Yeah, that's a fair comment. Um, I think just to round this out as well, um, the basing, I really love what you've done with the leaves and like the sort of uh, really, really dark center and, and the way the color sort of slowly blends into those brighter, nice sort of teal greens on the outside. Um, the use of the tufts as well, I think works, especially with these like more vibrant greens. It's very fitting of the setting. Um, however, I think personally that just th this, this particular area here around the front of the base, I think it's just a little bit plain, I think, compared to the sort of surrounding foliage. Yeah, I agree. I, I think, uh, Marion, again, to what you said, George, like the, the the way you've painted the leaves and stuff looks great. That the, that area, like they're set in like a jungle kind of environment and the, you don't really get 
like jungle is a dense environment like so i would really recommend like adding as much stuff onto the base to really sell that it's a jungle environment well i think even if you weren't going to necessarily add more materials maybe just adding some some soft color maybe some powder pigments or some green sort of glazing around there just to show that there is some sort of life to the earth i think you could you could glaze on like you said glaze on some greens and stuff to insinuate kind of like moss or stuff exactly, like that yeah. that would work really nicely um looking at the areas on there on that base that are stone as well this is the other thing like I always say this, like the models are completely plastic, obviously, and what you do and paint on the model renders and creates that that realism of material. I think one thing to potentially think about is when you're doing stone and things like that, to actually spend time investment on those areas of detail to try and make them resemble the inherent material that they are. And, and when it comes to stone, you could, that looks like a fallen pillar of like a, ancient civilization or something like that. You could easily just get a really, really controlled sponging or stippling just to add on some texture and variance of tone onto the stone so that it reads as stone. Cause at the moment it, it's a tan color, which is, which is great because for the contrast purposes of the miniature, however, it, it doesn't scream that it's stone. The only reason I know it's stone is because that's what it's sure. sculpted as, if you follow me. So yeah. I think potentially some areas for that would be like, there's a, a large sort of flat area here, which I think is looking just a little bit sort of laxed in that texture. Yeah. I think um, just some, just some dry brushing or some stippling, like you said, just around there, just to add a bit more, roughness to the surface i think would go a long way dry brush it stipple it sponge it whatever works for you but i do various tones of that uh just so that you that you could um that you could obviously sell that a, a bit more i think um looking at some of the edging as well i think the edging overall on on the piece is is well executed but i think definitely that's something where you i would definitely try and recommend as much time investment and practice that brush control to get the edges as consistent like you can definitely you've definitely got great ability with a brush but i think that when, when we look at some of the chunk, you can see there's some chunkier sort of desaturated highlight on there and you've got a brighter highlight. I think you just need to add a little bit more refined approach when it comes to like the latter stages. Your, your chunky looks looks decent. I said it's a little bit of a wiggle on some of the places, but I would definitely, i definitely try and just refine those pull strokes as much as possible. Yeah. That being said though, a, a very, very busy model. Yeah. Um, I think very well sectioned, very neatly done. It's obvious what all of the details are. There's some some great brushwork, especially on like sort of the top sections of the pillars up here. I think it looks really, really nice with those blue tones. And the feathers as well. The feathers look yeah, really, yeah, really great. Yeah, overall, great piece, I think. Yeah, perfect. It was really good. So thank you very much for watching this episode of Critique Clinic. I hope that you liked all the models in there and that what we've discussed and said about the pieces, both in an opinionated and factual basis, has helped you with your own painting. And if you would like to submit your miniatures for a future episode of Critique Clinic, please check out the links in the description of this episode and you'll find the link to our Patreon. If you become a member, you'll gain access to the Siege Studios Discord community. And over there, we have all of the details on how to submit your miniatures. Thank you, everyone. We will look forward to seeing you in the next episode.